called First Step in Running the Seminar. Remember the seminar's name. This is the SCB Emerging Issues in Conservation Seminar Series. So this is across the um, SCB journals, conservation letters, conservation biology, and conservation science and practice. So these seminars feature um, new research from one of the society's journals. Um, and today we're really lucky to have Laura and Rachel um, presenting their recent paper from Conservation Biology, Improving Species-Based Area Protection in Antarctica. So I'm going to give a bit of an um, introduction for Laura and Rachel, and then I'll pass over to them. But we expect our seminar today, which is recorded for those of you who are watching it later, to be about 35 minutes with some time for questions. So those of you who are attending live, uh, feel free to put some messages, um, questions in the chat, and um, we'll also have opportunity probably to ask any questions um, with your cameras on and in joint discussion at the end of today's uh, seminar. Okay, so let me introduce Laura and Rachel. So we have a bit of a time difference going on here. I'm presenting from the UK where it's now um, advanced into the late evening and Laura, Laura and Rachel have had to get up early um, in Australian Antipodean time um, to present this seminar. So thank you to you both for, for doing that. So Laura is an Antarctic scientist based at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. She works as a part time, well, as part of the International Research Initiative, securing Antarctica's environmental future. Laura has a wide range of research interests, including invertebrate physiology, invasion biology and macroecology. Her current focus is on the conservation of biodiversity in Antarctica, and she strives to conduct research that will inform policy and decision making for conservation planning in the Antarctic region. Rachel is our other speaker. So Rachel um, Lee is a senior scientist at the Arthur Ryder Institute for Environmental Research in Victoria, Australia. She received her PhD in community ecology from Monash University in 2020, where she studied the impact of human activities and Antarctic and sub-Antarctic biodiversity and the wilderness values. So Rachel is interested in understanding how and why ecological communities vary over space and time with the goal of supporting management and conservation decisions in Antarctica and southeastern Australia. So with that, I'm going to pass over to Laura and Rachel. Um, and thanks very much, guys. We're really looking forward to your presentation today. Great. Thanks so much for that intro, Katrina. And also thanks for hosting us. We do know how late it is there, so we really appreciate it. Um, and we'd also like to thank the Society for Conservation Biology for inviting us to speak as a part of this seminar series. We're really excited to share this work with you guys. So before we begin, we would like to acknowledge the people of the Kulin Nations on whose land we are speaking from today. We acknowledge their elders, past and present, and we also recognise First Peoples from around the globe. So as Katrina mentioned, Rachel and I will be presenting our recent work, which is looking at improving species-based area protection within Antarctica. And it's just going to be the two of us presenting today, but we'd like to also acknowledge our co-author for this paper, Stephen Chown. So before I get into the protected area part of the talk, I thought I'd just give a little overview of what exactly it is that we're trying to protect. So here are some pictures of the kinds of biodiversity that you get down on the Antarctic continent. So there are the birds and the seals that we're all quite familiar with, but then the system's also dominated by a range of these sort of weird and wonderful invertebrate species that you can see in the middle panel there. And these include things like tardigrades, mites and springtails. And then the flora system is composed largely of lichens and mosses with just two native vascular plant species on the continent. So then next, what are we protecting these species from? So sometimes it can seem as though Antarctica is this sort of far away and pristine wilderness area, but there are many threats to the Antarctic system which have also been ramping up in recent years. So these include firstly, the human footprint on the continent, and that's in terms of both scientific activity and tourism. So you can see from this figure at the top that the rate of tourism has increased significantly over the past decade, with the number of tourists visiting the continent in the 2019 and 2020 seasons 
more than doubling the number that visited between 2010 and 2011. Then we also have threats from invasive species, such as the annual bluegrass, which is pictured here. And then of course, the ever-present threat of climate change. And so these threats can also interact to cause an even greater problem. So for example, that figure on the right there shows the potential for non-native species to establish on the Antarctic Peninsula by 2100, based on the combined impacts of both climate change and human activity. So having a system in place that's going to protect the unique biodiversity of Antarctica from these threats is really vital. So the history of area protection within Antarctica is quite a short one. It begins in 1961 with the signing of the Antarctic Treaty by its consultative parties. And these are just each of the individual nations that have joined. So there were just 12 parties in the very beginning, but this has now grown to 29 consultative parties and a further 25 non-consulting parties. And so here we've got a photograph of the members at the very first Antarctic Treaty meeting, which was held in Canberra in Australia. Then shortly after this, in 1964, they established the option to designate protected areas in Antarctica under what was called the Agreed Measures for the Conservation of Antarctic Fauna and Flora. And then the next critical point was the agreement on the Protocol on Environmental Protection to the Antarctic Treaty, which was signed in 1991 and then put into force in 1998. And this designated Antarctica as a natural reserve devoted to peace and science. So within the protocol, Annex 5 is the section that's relating to protected areas. So Annex 5 describes that the parties should identify and establish a series of protected areas within a systematic environmental geographical framework. And these are called Antarctic Specially Protected Areas, or ASPAs for short, and we'll call them that throughout the remainder of this talk. So this map here shows the system of ASPAs that's currently in place. So you can see that they are distributed around the coastline of the continent with quite a high proportion on the Antarctic Peninsula. And so there are 66 terrestrial aspers currently in place, which cover an area of 2,171 kilometres squared. And this is less than 0.02% of the total land area on the Antarctic continent. So each of these protected areas are based on one or more of these nine values for protection, which were laid out in the protocol back in 1998. So I'll just go through them briefly one by one. So the first is for areas to be kept inviolate so that we can make future comparisons with areas that may have been impacted by human activities. Next is the ecosystem criteria, which aims to capture representative examples of all types of ecosystems on the continent. The third value is areas with important or unusual assemblages of species. And this includes breeding colonies of native birds or mammals. Next is the type locality or only known habitat of any species. And so the type locality is the geographical location from which the original specimen was collected and described. Then we have areas of particular scientific interest, examples of outstanding geological, glaciological and geomorphological features, areas of outstanding aesthetic and wilderness values, sites of historical importance. And then lastly, this general category, which is basically any of the previous values or any combination of them. But although there is this protocol in place to protect each of these values, 
Antarctica's network of specially protected areas has been repeatedly assessed as being both inadequate and unrepresentative. So for example, this graph here shows the number of aspers that have been primarily designated for each of the specific values. And as you can see, there's quite a high degree of variation in how well each of the categories is being represented. So there are heaps of aspers dedicated to protecting areas with unusual assemblages or breeding colonies of birds or mammals, especially compared to all of the other values there. And there is one value in particular for which there hasn't been any aspers designated primarily due to its value, and that is the type locality. <clears throat> so as I mentioned before, the type locality criterion within the protocol specifies that the type locality or only known habitat of any species within Antarctica should be protected. And it might seem like a little bit of an odd criterion at first, but it's really important for a couple of reasons. So firstly, the type locality is critical in terms of taxonomy, since it is the location from which this original specimen was collected and described. And it's important that these specimens can be recollected if they're ever lost, damaged or destroyed. And so an example of this occurring was the fire at the National Museum of Brazil back in 2018, where thousands of specimens were destroyed and essentially lost forever. So protecting the type locality ensures that these specimens will likely be available for recollection if anything like this does occur again. Then the second reason for the type locality's importance is that it is one of the main mechanisms for species-based protection because it ensures that any species can be protected even if we know little about their habitat or distribution. And this is especially important in an Antarctic context because for a lot of Antarctic species, we still really know little about their wider distribution. And the type locality might actually be the only known location for that species. But since this criterion has not yet been systematically addressed, we still don't know if this conservation goal set out in the Antarctic Treaty Protocol is being met or how many additional aspers we might need in order to meet these goals. So that's what we set out to find with our study here. So we first had to compile a list of Antarctic species within our target groups. So we focused on terrestrial and lacustrine animals, plants and lichens. Then some taxonomic groups like microbes and algae weren't included in our data set because for these groups, their species lists are still changing rapidly as new species are discovered and their taxonomy is being harmonized. So we then had to find and record the type localities for our species and then map these on the Antarctic continent to work out how many type localities are being captured within the current ASPA network. And then finally, we wanted to find how many new ASPAs might we need in order to capture any unprotected type localities. So those that are not currently represented within the ASPA network. So to do this, we started with a systematic literature search to construct a database of all of our target species within Antarctica. And then after we developed this list, we went back to the original species descriptions to find their type localities. And you can see from these examples here that the type localities varied quite widely in terms of how specific they were. So the first example at the top there is for the Adelie penguin, who has the type locality of Adelie land. And that's an area that's over 400,000 kilometers squared in size. And then that can be compared to this more specific record underneath, which is for a lichen whose type locality was field rock in McRobertson land, which is a very specific location. So this variation in the precision of localities was a challenge that we had to deal with throughout the study. Um, and it's something that I'll come back to in just a moment. 
So lastly, we classified localities as being either north or south of 60 degrees south in latitude because our target region was all species who had type localities that were south of 60 degrees south, as this is the Antarctic Treaty region, which is where the protocol on area protection applies. So first up, here are some results looking at the range of species that occur within Antarctica. So there were 1,142 species in total in the groups that we looked at. These were dominated by lichens, of which there were 470 species, and that was followed by mosses and then a range of invertebrates like mites, rotifers, tardigrades and nematodes. And then in terms of a further breakdown with regards to the location of type localities, 55% of Antarctic species had type localities that fell outside of the Antarctic Treaty area. So these were those that occurred north of 60 degrees south in latitude. And then 41% were from our target region within the Antarctic Treaty area. And then for the localities within this group, we further split them into either a coarse resolution or high resolution category, depending on how precise their type locality was. So for this, we used a 25 kilometers squared area as a threshold. So localities such as the one from a daily land would go into that coarse resolution category and then more precise localities such as the one from filled rock would go into that high resolution category. So it was really a trade-off between capturing as many type localities as we could, while also excluding those really vague or imprecise records. And there were a total of 386 localities within this high resolution category. And these were the ones that we used to examine the distribution of type localities across the Antarctic continent. So now I'll pass over to Rachel, who will explain how we mapped these localities. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Laura. So next we wanted to know where the Antarctic type localities are and whether they're protected by the existing network of Antarctic specially protected areas, and also how many new protected areas we'd need if we were to capture all of the high resolution records in our data set. Because we used 25 square kilometers as our inclusion threshold when we created the data set, we initially selected 25 kilometer squared areas around the coordinates of each of the type localities. And where these areas overlapped for neighboring localities, we merged them together into one area. We then compared each of these areas with the species descriptions to ensure that they were capturing the relevant geographic features from the original type locality descriptions. So in some instances, we were able to further refine these areas to exclude places that didn't match the original reference material. So as an example, this is the type description for uh, a species on Penguin Island along the Antarctic Peninsula. And the type locality area doesn't need to capture that section of the neighboring island. We then calculated which type localities were captured within the existing network of Antarctic terrestrial protected areas by overlaying these areas, including localities that might be just outside the boundaries of the current protected areas. For all other points, we considered those to be unprotected by the existing network. Our results, including whether or not we considered a type locality to be protected by the existing ASPAs, but also the number and the size of new areas that it would take to protect the remaining type localities is really dependent on the size of that threshold that we draw around each area. So as Laura explained, this threshold was chosen to include as many type localities in the analysis as possible in order to maximize the representation of species while also excluding imprecise records. If a smaller threshold was chosen, we might be able to further refine the size and the number of new protected areas, but this would come at a cost of not capturing as many species in the network. Our main result is that of the 386 type localities that we included in our analysis, 
28% of the sites are already captured by the existing network of specially protected areas. And so this is a map of where the type localities are distributed across Antarctica and the green points are those that are within or directly adjacent to the existing protected areas and the purple points are those that are outside of the protected area network. So of the protected type localities, they're distributed widely across the continent and they're found already in 41 of the 66 terrestrial aspers. The remaining 278 type localities are not captured by the existing network and it would take establishing another 105 new protected areas to capture these values in a representative way. This would more than double the size of the Antarctic Specially Protected Areas Network. These areas are also distributed widely around the continent, mostly around the coastal margins, and they vary in their size and in the number of species type localities that they could protect. 23% of the candidate aspers that we've created also intersect with the existing human infrastructure footprint meaning that they overlay areas that have infrastructure like research stations and field camps. So what actions can the Antarctic Treaty Parties take to further protect type localities? For the localities that are already within the existing protected areas network, there are a couple of opportunities. Firstly, parties could formally recognize type localities that are within ASPAs by including them in the relevant ASPA management plans. So this would ensure that their specific value as a type locality is considered when decisions are being made about entry permits into the areas and what kind of activities can take place. Second, managers could verify that the species with type localities along the borders of the aspers have habitat that's actually captured within the protected area, which is an assumption that we've made. If not, they might require a slight adjustment of the ASPA boundaries to ensure that the species habitat is actually represented within the protected area. And finally, the species occupancy at all of the sites needs to be confirmed because some of these specimens were collected over a hundred years ago. So it's important to determine if the species are actually still present at their type locality and if they're there in ecologically significant numbers. It might be also important to assess how species persistence is going to change under future climate change scenarios. And for those at risk, it might be necessary to take additional steps to make sure that their type material is secure. For the type localities that are not protected by the existing ASPA network, the most straightforward action that the Antarctic Treaty parties could take would be to expand the protected areas network to capture all of the remaining type localities. And so that's all of those purple points on the map there. But there are a number of challenges here. Expanding the network in this way would more than double the number of protected areas, and it would nearly double the total area of the network, which increases the management burden on parties to administer and to monitor these places and also to routinely update their management plans. Given the current slow pace of terrestrial protected area designation in Antarctica that's persisted over the last few decades, this approach might be currently out of reach. There has however been some recent progress in this area. So since we finished our analysis in September last year, Three new ASPAs have been created, which are the first new terrestrial protected areas in Antarctica since 2014. Two of these areas actually overlap or partially overlap with two of our proposed areas, meaning that they include the type localities of a lichen and a mite species. These ASPAs were primarily designated as areas of scientific uh, interest to scientific research or as an area to be kept in violet so that future comparisons can be made with sites that are more heavily impacted by human activity. But the type localities in these areas are not mentioned in their new management plans. And so their value for type locality protection has not yet been recognized. A second challenge for any species-based area protection approach is that the species list that we've used in our analysis, but also possibly to designate new protected areas 
It represents our understanding of biodiversity at a fixed point in time. But as we know, species taxonomy is dynamic and it's constantly evolving as new species are discovered and others are split or grouped. So there's a risk then, uh, for example, that you might establish two protected areas for two seemingly unique species, which are later grouped together, calling into question the validity of those protected areas. To reduce some of this burden, Antarctic Treaty Parties could instead prioritize protecting areas that have multiple type localities or to adopt a systematic conservation planning approach to identify areas that include other environmental values as well, such as their wilderness value, their geological value or important ecosystems. So that approach is in keeping with the systematic environmental geographic framework that was envisioned by the protocol. Another challenge lies where the type of localities directly overlap with areas of existing human infrastructure. So many of the type specimens were collected near research stations, for example, because scientists use those stations as bases from which they conducted their research. Antarctic stations are often also built in some of the most biodiversity rich areas of the continent and particularly in ice free areas and on the coastal margins. And so as an example, this is Port Lockroy Station, and it sits on a small island in the Antarctic Peninsula. But eight lichen species have their type localities on that small island. One solution could be to protect these areas and these type localities by designating them as Antarctic specially managed areas, which differ from Antarctic specially protected areas in that they don't require an entry permit, and they generally offer a lower level of environmental protection. As an alternative type of area-based conservation measure that's used in Antarctica, asthmas have had mixed success. So it would be important to secure the species habitat near stations and possibly even to collect additional type materials, recognizing that these areas have been subject to greater disturbance in the past and are likely to be subject to greater disturbance in the future. Lastly, the Antarctic Treaty Parties could choose to focus on the only known habitat of species, which is that second part of the type locality criterion. So species habitats often more extensive than a single locality. And so this would increase the likelihood that they could be captured within a protected areas network without necessarily having to protect each unique type locality. This approach would also allow parties some flexibility to protect areas with higher habitat quality, well-connected ecosystems, or places where species are more likely to persist into the future, which may or may not be their type locality. This approach would also offer species-based area protection to those taxa that we excluded from our analysis because their type locality descriptions were missing or they were too vague to identify to a specific site. And even those species that have type localities outside of the Antarctic Treaty area. There's still a difficulty here though, because for most Antarctic species, we don't yet have species distribution data and biological surveys that would be needed to map their, their habitat are not currently a priority for most of the Antarctic Treaty parties. Advances in ecological modeling techniques and methods that can rapidly or remotely survey areas like environmental DNA sampling and remote sensing could help here. So today we've outlined a few options for improving species-based area protection in Antarctica, but it's worth considering if this situation is unique. I'm not aware of any other networks of protected areas that have been established with the primary aim of conserving species type localities. And perhaps especially for microinvertebrates and non-vascular plant species. There are however parallels between type locality protection and reserve creation efforts elsewhere that focus on very rare, restricted or threatened species. Antarctic is also a unique situation in that the parties to the Antarctic Treaty have committed to this action 
And there are relatively few species overall compared to biodiversity elsewhere. So there's a genuine opportunity here to fulfill the ambitions set out in the protocol to explicitly and systematically protect most, if not all, of the described species for the continent. And the type locality criterion might be one way to achieve this goal really rapidly. The creation of more protected areas in Antarctica could also help us to meet global targets in the protected areas of state. Okay, so just to conclude, the Antarctic Treaty parties have made this commitment to protect Antarctic species and environments. And this does include the type locality of any species. But to do this effectively, they really need to revise and expand the existing Aspen network. And given the increasing threats from things like human activity and climate change, Species-based area protection is a tool that could help secure Antarctic biodiversity well into the future. So finally, we'd just like to acknowledge our funders of this project. So this research was done as a part of the Australian Research Council funded program, Securing Antarctica's Environmental Future. And it was also funded by an Australian Antarctic Program grant. And that brings our presentation to an end. So thanks so much for your attention and we're happy to take any questions now. Thanks, Laura and Rachel. That was a really wonderful presentation. Um, I'll invite everyone who's attending this um, talk live, if you'd like to turn on your cameras um, and unmute yourselves, um, this is an opportunity to ask any questions. Uh, you can also put some questions in the chat. So while um, everyone's gathering their thoughts, I had some questions for you both. I, I'm really interested to see, well, I'm not really familiar with this, this study area and I don't understand very well, how do the costs of ASPAs scale? Are they, is it sort of, are we, is it a greater transaction cost in that any new ASPA has to um, hit the desks of multiple people in different countries with different jurisdictions? Or is there a sort of a financial cost for management so my question is, would costs for new ASPOs scale as a function of their size, or are they sort of more um, related just to a, a single unit? As in, could you just have one really large ASPO because the cost is in establishment, not in um, incremental increases in size? Yeah, so in terms of um, when they're establishing a new ASPA, it is quite a process in terms of one or more parties will propose the ASPA and then that has to go to every single other party um, to, and then they have to agree on it by consensus. And then each of these ASPAs also require a management plan, which is quite extensive. So it includes things like the flora and fauna in the area, any research stations, any past activity, future activity, as well as all of the conditions for the permits for entry. Um, so yeah, in terms of whether the cost is based on unit or area, I would say it's probably more on each individual unit since um, the party who proposes it, they're the one looking after that ASPA and you know, they're the ones that are dealing with the permits and everything and there will just be you know, one permit uh, management guide per ASPA. Um, but in terms of area, it might be a bit more difficult to get those in place just because of um, if other parties have conflicting sort of ideas about how they want to use that area in the future. So it might be a bit more difficult to yet yeah, put larger ones into place. Um, but I think the costs in terms of the future management um, I don't, I think it would be more based on number of ASPAs rather than area of ASPA. And then, yeah, those management plans as well, they're revised on a five yearly basis. So that's another sort of burden to the system that, that yeah, we have to think about as well. That's really interesting. So across, was it 19 initial signatories to the convention? Uh, 12. 12. What, what's, the, what's the breakdown of the current ASPAs to those 12 signatories, 12 members? I'm not exactly sure of the exact breakdown, but I know that there's, there are sort of, you know, 
three or so parties that are in charge of most of the ASPAs. Um, so that is also an issue because, of course, parties that have a lot of ASPAs they're already looking after might be less willing to then propose a new ASPA because, you know, they've already got all of these ASPAs to, to manage. Um, but I think now, more recently, there's been a lot more ASPAs that are proposed by multiple parties rather than just a single party, um, especially with all of those new sort of parties that have been added in since the original signing of the treaty. So I think that's really good in terms of reducing the burden for those countries that were in, you know, the treaty very early on and who might have to manage a lot of the ASTAs. What an interesting system. Why, like, what's your feeling? Why was type locality included as one of these initial objectives and then never looked at again? Surely someone must have thought it was a good idea in order to get it in amongst what were they? There was only sort of, was there 12 um, characteristics that ASPAS are supposed to be based on? Um, ooh, how many Nine. were there? Nine. 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 <laughs> I remember. Yeah. So it's um, interesting that, yeah, clearly someone thought it was important enough to mention, but. Yeah. Oh, I think their idea is that they would like to protect, you know, they want a, a method for protecting every species. So to have that sort of comprehensive level of protection on the Antarctic um, continent. But the type locality, it's because we don't really know the distribution of a lot of species. So there are a lot that the type locality is the only sort of data point we have for them. And so it's just one way that, you know, we know that it, the species was there at some point in time. So we can protect that area. And then that's one way to protect, to have that wider level of protection on the continent. Um, but yeah, in terms of why it hasn't been looked at until now, I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> I think they've just been um, sort of more prioritising those, I guess, charismatic species, like the unusual assemblages, you know, that sort of birds and seals and things. Um, and they're easy, a bit easier, I think, because, you know, you can see them. They have maybe clearer defined boundaries as to where breeding colonies are. So, Yeah. It would seem to be, um, just a reminder for anyone else who's um, attending this presentation live, um, feel free to ask a question either, um, take your, cap, put your camera on and ask in person, or you can just put your questions in the chat. Um, apologies, and, and saying that, of course, I've completely forgotten um, my next point. <laughs> I'm, well, actually, that was it. So I'm really interested, I think it was point five you said in terms of, you know, other options for protected area management in Antarctica, which is to use species current distribution. That, that would seem to be the next logical follow-on from this study, would be to, which I'm sure was no small feat in terms of the amount of um, review <laughs> of really, um, I imagine, very difficult records were required to be chased down in order to put together this research. But that would seem to be the next step for you to go forward and say, um, you know, here's the species with lots of substitute sites available because we know they're found here as well. Yeah, yeah, I um, actually, at the moment, I'm sort of looking at a list. There's a published list of which species are already known to occur in all of the aspects. So I'm trying to sort of compile that and compare that to our type localities list to see, you know, are some of these species which their type of locality is currently unprotected, are they already, the species themselves, actually protected within another ASPA? And then that might um, sort of, yeah, reduce the, the number of those species that are sort of completely unprotected at this point. Yeah. There would also seem to be really different um, size requirements for the, the size of the ASPA required to protect different species. Could you, can you imagine incorporating that into your analysis? Um, because you've at the moment are you assuming 25k size what, what's the size of aspect you've assumed for your proposed area do you want me to take this one Laura go for it <laughs> yeah so yeah so we started with an initial 25 kilometer squared area and then we refined that if you know if the if the island is smaller than 25 kilometers squared we don't need to protect the ocean it's not habitat but I think what, what's really limiting us from making sp smaller or more species specific aspers is just a, a lack of knowledge about the habitat requirements of all of these species. So there's a thousand, over a thousand species in our data set and we don't have you know, good survey data to know, you know the, their range distributions. We don't know what all, necessarily all of their habitat requirements are. 
their abundance distributions. So whether or not the type localities are actually sort of the best, highest quality habitat that for each of those species is something that we just don't know. And so, like Laura said, it's just one place that we, we know where that species is and whether or not um, we should be protecting sort of a larger area around that um, comes down to we needed to make a sort of a decision about uh, which records we were going to include and exclude. And that sort of threshold resolution we chose was 25 square kilometres. And that's based on, on previous work that's looked at environmental values in Antarctica, but it's also recognising that uh, species move around and their distributions might have shifted a bit. And so trying to capture that habitat um, as well as possible within the network. But we'd recommend that if these uh, candidate aspers were actually to be protected, then there would need to be a survey of the site to make sure that the habitat's represented and that the species are there in ecologically significant numbers so that the protected area is actually going to do what we want it to do, which is conserve species and biodiversity. Absolutely. And so yeah, I'm trying to think back to the images you showed for where your proposed aspers are relative to existing aspers. I was imagining it would be more hotly clustered around where people typically go, um, but maybe it is in that there's, they're, they're very coastal. We've got um, yeah. some wonderful biases, I'm sure, are present in the system and that we've got no idea what's present more than 150 k's inland. Yeah, I mean, well, if we knew the, the sort of the distribution of every species, we might assume that the type locality might just be on the very edge of that distribution where it was most accessible or we know that they that humans sort of came in from, from the coastal areas of Antarctica and we got to the, you know, the interior sites later in our, you know, in time. And so other type localities on sort of the edges of their, of their ranges, that's another thing that could really be interesting to look at. But most of the biodiversity is restricted to the ice-free areas of the continent, and they make up about 0.05% of the total land area of Antarctica. And so we do expect that most biodiversity records and so most type localities will be in coastal ice-free areas. Mm. There's also a bit of a like bias towards current aspects being designated near the stations of the parties who have designated you know the ASPA just for I guess management purposes it's a lot easier for them to manage an ASPA that's nearby so I was looking at the map the other day actually and there's sort of in the bottom uh, left corner there's sort of a little a chunk of the continent that doesn't actually have any ASPAs on it at the moment um, and that does have a couple of our sort of candidate ASPAs we've proposed and I think uh, one of the reasons is that that is actually the unclaimed territory of Antarctica. So I guess no one really wants to be the one to look after that area when it's so far away from all of their other stations and things. But I think that is an important um, point that we, we you know, the, there is the goal to have this comprehensive systematic approach, which obviously sort of hasn't happened so far. So hopefully this can sort of bring light to that as well, where there's that missing, those missing sections. You know. Yeah, absolutely. It, it really does um, point out some really great, as you say, some biases in terms of where these areas are located. I wonder, what's your feeling for how threats, like are, are threats a decreasing function of distance from the coast? Are, you know, are, are areas which are not um, in coastal ice-free areas, are they is at risk from human activities, human influence as coastal areas? So yeah. I and, and I, people have very strong views about threat maps, but if you were to do a threat map, would it be red hot around the coast and then um, cooler towards the center? I think so. I think especially on the peninsula, that's one of the areas that is sort of most at risk because that's the easiest area for tourists to get to um, and it's the most frequently visited by tourists. And it's also the area that is going to warm the most, I think, or is predicted to um, sort of warm and then the ice is expected to disappear a bit more from that area as well, which can, um, I guess the, the tourism increase decreases that dispersal barrier for invasive species and then climate change decreases the establishment barrier as well. So I think that's probably the most at risk area um, and it's actually where most of the aspers are and a lot of the unprotected type localities are at the moment as well. Yeah. You're right. So it is entirely appropriate that we're protecting the coast because those are the areas that we're threatening. Um, and, and that's where we know um, where things are. 
But even in isolated places that we don't really visit that often, because they've been isolated for so long, they're almost pristine habitat. And so even really transient visits to places that haven't been directly impacted by humans can have a, a significant impact. And for example, we might be transferring um, indigenous species on the continent between areas that haven't been connected for hundreds, thousands of years. And so there's the risk that we're going to potentially reorganize Antarctic biodiversity in the future. And so ASPAs are one, one of the mechanisms that um, could help limit this in some way. Absolutely. Guys, that was a really fantastic talk. Um, we don't have any other questions, just a few comments in the chat about it um, being a really interesting talk. Um, so thank you very much, both of you, for, for putting together for this research, which was um, excellent and is in conservation biology, I believe in the January. Uh, maybe it's not, it hasn't been assigned an issue yet. Um, I'm not sure if it's been assigned yet. Yeah, yeah. it seemed quite quick, actually. Yeah, no, so just um, available um, ahead of, ahead of um, publication on the issue. Okay. So I will stop the recording there. So once again, thank you both, Laura and Rachel. That was a fantastic talk. Thanks for having us.